is um, because I've come here, you don't know me, I don't know you, but it's wonderful to be here. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and um, I have a three-line bio. Um, before, I, before I got one of these, um, before I became the curate at uh, St. Hugh's Church, just over um, on the other side of Luton, um, I trained as a barrister, I ran a laser quest, and then I worked as a, as a, as a consultant with a project management company in the city of London. And, and out of all of that, God called me into this. And, and it's actually a really fantastic opportunity um, today for me to speak to you a little bit about where you're at and also a bit about where I've been at. I think that, that some of my story actually um, will be quite relevant to you as you as a church wrestle with this this, this brand new season, as you look out onto this vacancy and you say, well, God, we know where we've been as a church, but what do you have for us next? And, and the word that, that, that I wanted to come and bring um, this morning, it comes out of that, that passage um, in Ezekiel 47. And, and I have to say, and, and I'm really pleased to be able to say this, that the, the thing I'm going to be saying to you has changed me. I'm not, I'm not going to say this to you as a kind of theoretical thing, something that, um, that oh, you know, maybe, you know, if, if we kind of, if we do this, maybe, maybe we'll kind of see this, this sort of happen. This word has changed my life. This passage has changed my life. It changed the direction of where I was going. It changed the thoughts that I had about who God was, who his church was, who I was in relation to all of those things. So, so I'm kind of building it up at the beginning now, aren't I? I'm going to have to kind of live up to this. It's quite, quite big, but for me it really is. For me, this word has changed my life. Um, and so just kind of at the beginning, um, talking about, Ezekiel 47. I want to give you the, the strap line. Today, this is all about getting in the river. I don't know if um, I might have a slide, possibly. Uh, this is all about getting in the river. It doesn't matter. The slides, are, <laughs> I only ever put pictures up. That's all I ever do. <laughs> and um, it's about getting in the river. And I really think that at the outset of this vacancy, as you as a church look around, and, and once again, because I know it hasn't been a long time for you, once again, you say, okay, God, what do you have for us? What do you have for me? I think he's really saying to you, will you get in the river with me? So, I promised you a story. I'm going to, going to give you a story. Um, my story, that, that, that kind of that bizarre three-line bio, led me um, to, to working in London. And I was working in London, and, um, and, and I had a very bizarre summer. A few years ago, well, I, I always tell this story, and I say a few years ago, and it's, it's increasingly getting more and more years ago. Um, about seven years ago, a very, very strange summer. And there was, a, there was a three week period in the middle of that summer when something really dramatic happened. I'd um, grown up being part of a, of a church that wasn't part of the Church of England um, and uh, had, had, had received a faith that, um, that I was blessed to, to kind of in some way inherit from my parents and see modeled for me. And I was blessed to, to, to be led into that and then to be able to receive it for myself. And, 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 and I did that as, as kind of teenagers and children do over a period of time, it, beginning to make that choice again and again and again. Oh, I've, I've, I've gone to university. Do I still want to do this? Yes, I do. I'd done that. But I never thought that God would call me into the church. Never. And then I had this strange summer when, when not one, but two, three, four people on one day came, came to me and my wife and they said, I think maybe Andy should think about ministry in 
the Church of England. And, and they, weren't, they weren't the sort of people who, 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 who were just saying, oh, I think this is a good idea. I thought, actually, that these are people who are Christians, and, and maybe these are actually people who might hear God occasionally, and they might get it right occasionally. But all the same, my response was, you what? You've got to be mad. And then I had a very strange experience. Three weeks later, I was in, uh, we were part of a small group at a different church um, in, in the area where we lived, which wasn't anywhere near any of those other people. Um, they didn't know any of those people. And um, we were in a, a small group. We were having a social at our house. We didn't run the small group. One of the guys who ran the small group saw me on my own across the room. And we locked eyes. And you could see him make the decision that he was going to come over and he was going to say something to me. And at that moment, I knew exactly what he was going to say even before he said it. I really had you on my mind this week. I think maybe you should think about ministry in the Church of England. What? What do you do with something like that? Well, at this point, I had this image in my head of God leaning down to try and talk to me and me with my hands clasped firmly over my ears, you know, as tight as possible. And he's speaking so loudly and so close that I can actually feel his breath on the back of my neck. That's what it felt like. And what you can't do with something like that is that you can't ignore it entirely. I, that bridge was crossed. So I went, I began a process of, of trying to discover whether God was really saying this, trying to test this word, trying to ask other people to pray for me, um, ask, asking God particularly, God, is this real? And if you've ever been through an experience like that, um, then, then maybe you had an experience like mine, that God absolutely refused to say yes or no. He said all sorts of other things, but it almost seemed like there was a, a bunch of stages I needed to go through. A bunch of things which he needed to chip off on either side. Things that I'd built up in myself. Things that I allowed to build up around me that he needed to deal with. But still, he didn't say yes or no. So I pursued him further. And I took myself off right out of my comfort zone. Right out of my fairly Pentecostally not really Church of england the tradition. And I, went, and I went on retreat at a Franciscan friary in deepest, darkest Dorset. And I lay on the floor in my whitewashed room and I waited on him. And that's when he started to speak through Ezekiel 47. So I wonder if... Um, I wonder if we might turn to that. Ezekiel, this is the end of Ezekiel. If you've ever read Ezekiel, this is the end of a pretty long book in the Bible by one of these major prophets, major Old Testament prophets, towards the end of, of, of Israel's time um, in terms of the time scale of the, the Old Testament. And, and Ezekiel, Ezekiel has spent the previous seven chapters to this. And if you ever read them, good luck. Giving a very, very detailed master plan for the building of a new, temp a new temple. It's, it's measurements and fittings and the heights and widths of doors and the lengths of walls. It's detailed. It's specific. God is giving Ezekiel a, a, bit of a, a bit of a taste of some sort of master plan. And, and obviously, well, it may seem obvious, but um, maybe for some of us it isn't. As soon as we start talking about the temple, as soon as, we, as, soon as anywhere within the Bible we find mention of the temple, particularly when we're talking about this temple in Ezekiel, what we're talking about is the place of God's presence. In the Old Testament, the temple was the place where God's presence resided. It was the place where Israel was able to come into 
the place of God's presence. It gave a certain um, structure and order and, um, and a right way of coming towards God. If you've ever watched um, that Indiana Jones film, you know the one with the Ark of the Covenant? And then and they open it up and their faces all melt off? You know that one? That's what Israel are worried about. Israel don't want to get God's presence wrong. They don't want to be wrong in God's presence. They want to get this right. So, because there's power there. And so that's, that's what the temple is. The temple is this, this interaction space between Israel and his people. But then we get to Ezekiel 47. I might have a different version from you. Then he brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. So what we've got is we've got this image of the gates of the temple. Now the main gate is kind of before Ezekiel at this point. He starts kind of here. And what he sees is that beneath the threshold of the gates, under the door, something seeping out. And it's water. It's like a, like a spring. And it's just bubbling out, just, just a little bit. And at this point, as, as we'll see later on, he's, he's, he's still in this kind of measurement mode. So he's giving us all these kind of descriptions of it. And, and it's a thin channel. It's a little trickle. And then Ezekiel starts to go on a walk. And he starts walking. And he's still in measurement mode. We get this great kind of description, very precise. Fits with our scientific minds. He goes along a bit. And then, and then he measures it. And it's a bit deeper. And then he goes along a little bit further. And he measures it. And it's a bit wider. And then he goes on and on and on. And eventually, he reaches the point where he says that it was so deep and it was so wide that no one could swim across it. That little trickle had become a vast, teeming river. And And it goes on. It goes down into the desert area. Now, um, it mentions um, something called the Araba. And the Araba is the, is, the, is, the, is the Jordan Rift Valley. It's kind of a, a geographic region that um, runs kind of from the north to the south. Um, and it, and it, it's roughly kind of the entire length of Israel. Um, and that particular area of Israel is really, really dry. Um, and, and part of that area also has the Dead Sea and kind of the areas around the Dead Sea. And if you know anything about the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea is, is a saltwater lake. It's, and nothing really grows around that either because it's salt water. So you have, the, you have the combination. This river is going down directly towards the most desert place. And this river's going down to the sea, which even though that's wet, that doesn't support life either. But this is the big bit. And um, I like the way that the the message translation quotes um, verse 9. It says this about the river. Wherever the river flows, life will flourish. Great schools of fish because the river is turning the salt sea into fresh water. Where the river flows, life abounds. There's something about this river. If you, if you kind of had a, um, a bucket of, of water in the garden, like say, say you had a kind of an old bin or something or an old plant pot and you kind of left it out and, and it stayed there for a, for a few months and it got filled up with water and, and the water, you know, it turns kind of green. Anyone had that? Or maybe, maybe your pond gets a bit like that. Would anyone, um, what would happen if you kind of poured a whole bunch of fresh water into that water? 
you'd just have even more dirty, moldy water, wouldn't you? Well, that's not what happens here. What happens with this river is that this river goes down into the salt water, goes down into the Dead Sea, and it doesn't dilute it, but it transforms it, it changes it. This river's kind of different. And this, this is God's master plan for Ezekiel. He's releasing this spring into the desert. It's to bring transforming life into the places that are most dead and lifeless. It will refresh. It will restore. It will bring nourishment and healing. So, if we go back to me in my white cell in the Franciscan friary in deepest, darkest Dor Dorset. That was when God dropped a bomb for me. Into that, he said this, that's my church. That's my church. That life that flows out. That's what I want to see for my church. That freshness that doesn't just stop with the trickle, but goes on to become the flood. That's my church. That new life that creates a river that, that, that trees grow up beside, that people can fish by, that, that, that livelihoods are built up by and restored, that, that people get to, get, to, get, to, get to live in this life. That's why my church exists. That's what it's for. And for me, the penny just dropped. God loves his church. God's church is his plan to restore the nations to himself. And we, we are his church. Christ Church Bushmead is his church. I realized that I realized that I've been standing here. I've been standing by the gate, by the big doors, and I've been looking out and I've been only seeing this trickle. But that trickle becomes an ocean. Let me tell you about there's um there's a hospital. Um, in fact, it's the oldest hospital in Paris. And it's called the Hotel Dieu, which is the Hotel of God. And it's the oldest um, hospital in Paris. It's, that, that actually became the French term for hospital, Hotel Dieu. The Hotel of God. And why is that? That's because the church started them. It was the church. It was monastic and religious communities, church communities, who wanted to heal and care for the sick. What about education? Well, there are quite a lot of church schools in this country. And that the reason that the church is involved in providing education um, for all children, um, regardless of their ability to pay, is because they were doing it, well, the church was doing it, we were doing it, long before the government started doing it. In fact, um, there, if you follow the history of it, the, the Sunday school movement and the national schools movements of the 18th and 19th centuries are recognized, both outside and inside the church, as the indispensable forerunners of the modern universal schooling system. Take the church out of these stories. And what does our world look like? What does our country look like? What does our nation look like?
I think it's a bit like this. This is Iceland, which is a wonderful place if you've ever been for, for geographic formations and things like this. But there's this wonderful, wonderful river that's flowing through this valley. But of course you know that it was the river that formed the valley. It was the river that shaped the valley. Little by little, age by age, the river carved out the land. And that's not even a big river. That's a little one. Imagine what a big one would do. I think God is calling us into this river. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about one of my other great passions, as well as the church, surfing. I don't know if you've ever been surfing. As a child, I spent um, several holidays, summer holidays, having persuaded my parents to go and camp near Newquay and take me and my sisters um, down onto the beach, Fistral Beach, every, every, every day um, for surfing lessons. And I um, have to say that um, I was never any good at it at all. <laughs> <laughs> this is not me. <laughs> I, I spent an awful lot of time lying face down in the water, and I spent quite a lot of time face first in the water as well. But, but one thing that I did learn about, about, about surfing is, is the basic principle of what you do. You stand in the water. And you wait for the wave. And then when the wave comes, you begin, to, you lie on your board and you begin to propel yourself forward so that you're beginning to match the speed of the wave. But you only have to do that for just a moment. There's only really kind of a moment of your activity that you need to do. And then if you time it just right, the, the wave will come and will take you and carry you on it just down in front of it. And all of the power and the momentum of the wave will, will bring you along. And then I, I managed to do that bit. That was the bit I could do. The bit I couldn't do is that then from your, 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 your place on the wave, lying flat on this board, you had to do a thing called popping up. Is there any, is anyone, is anyone here who's ever been surfing? Yeah. Trevor. You, you, um, what you do when you pop up is you put, you put your hands on either side, and then you gradually move your way into a sort of kneeling position, and then from there, you, you kind of get onto your feet and then gradually kind of ease up. And if you've managed to do that without falling off, then my hat is off to you because it's hard, <laughs> but it's amazing. The thrill of it is amazing. Now, this came back to me earlier in the year when God spoke to me of some of the things that were happening at St. Hughes. St. Hughes is the church that I'm part of over, over on the other side of Luton. And God, I was in a worship time, and, and, and suddenly this image came into my mind. And God said, there's a wave coming. Ride the wave. Now, I've already told you about my surfing experience and surfing lack of ability. So obviously, my first response was, God, I can't surf. <laughs> and when you know you can't surf, turning around and standing in the water and looking at the wave can be quite intimidating. It's coming. <laughs> But I didn't know what God meant. I didn't know what that meant. But I was interested. 
the first thing that seemed to start to happen was that amongst our staff team and amongst some of the kind of leaders within our church, there seemed to be a, 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 a shared desire all of a sudden for greater intimacy with God. A, a, a desire to really, uh, can, we, can we meet together and have another worship time? Can we, can we pray together in the morning? Can we, can we fit that in? We do everything, you know, on our diaries, don't we? I don't know if you're like that, but I live by my diary. So I had to find more times, and I was kind of finding first time and middle time and, and, and bottom time because, because I needed to, needed to somehow fit this in my day. But, it, but I knew that if I didn't do that, then it wouldn't happen. But, but we were all feeling in our hearts, yeah, we just want to do this. We want to spend more time with God. That was the first thing that happened. Then after that, there began to be a sort of a noticeable increase in, in the things that the Holy Spirit seemed to be doing when we met together. So in our prayer times, I've already prayed with, for, with some of you here, and it's, it's some, you, you tend to listen for, for words. Well, suddenly, rather than kind of sort of more silence like we've been used to, suddenly actually more people were hearing things from God. And they were interesting things as well. More, more people were, um, people were engaging more with our worship times. They were, they were finding that, that suddenly kind of much more, more interesting. And actually people were saying as well that in their devotions, it wasn't just happening in church, it was when they went home, actually suddenly they, were, they, were, they had a new energy for spending time with God on their own, for praying, for reading the Bible. That was the next thing that happened. And then it started to impact our Sunday services. Now we have, um, unlike you, we, we have two services on a Sunday morning. And, um, and our earlier one, which starts at 9 o'clock, is, is, is more traditional than, than our later one, which is more of a family service. And, um, and so for it, I actually wear, I know you're not, you're not even used to this here, are you? But... Um, I, I, wear, I, wear, I wear a big white robe, and I feel wonderful. No, I don't. I, <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. Church of England, it's a thing. You know what? God can move in those places too. So one morning in our nine o'clock service, someone had spoken, and um, and. And we just felt, felt led to, to get people to pray for each other where they were standing. So, um, so, so I was kind of standing sort of near the front. And then um, the, I turned around to pray with two ladies um, at, at, on the second row. And um, a lady called Barbara. We were praying for a lady called Barbara. And we'd been praying for a minute. When I looked up and all of a sudden I started to see her doing this. I thought, hey, oh. And, um, and, and, and the, and the, kind of, the, the, the other lady I was praying with, uh, a, a big kind of black lady, Caribbean lady for, um, called Mama Sylvia, said, are you all right? Are you going to fall over? Which Barbara's response was, no, I'm fine. <laughs> Needless to say, she continued to rock back and forth. And I was like, wow, this is, this is starting to get a bit strange. So, I could see that she was starting to go. I thought there's nothing for it. And I put one hand on the, the seat in front, hitched up my big white robe in another, and leapt over the first row of chairs just in time to catch her and lay her down in the row as the spirit took her out. I wasn't expecting that. She wasn't expecting that either. When I talked to her sort of a little bit, little bit later, when, she, when she'd kind of come round, the, um, she said, I don't remember what happened. I've got no idea what happened. All I remember is Sylvia saying to me, are you going to fall over? And me saying no, and then that was it. But you know what? Sometimes, and if you've heard these stories, stories about things like that that happened before, sometimes we, are, we wonder, what, Why? Why is God doing that? It's just surely completely ridiculous. People are just getting kind of overcome with the emotion of it, falling over because they've got it all emotional. 
Well, you know what? It was really fantastic to see with Barbara what God was doing out of that. I spoke to her two weeks later, and she said, God's been speaking to me, and, and I think I really need to come and reaffirm my baptism vows. And that's something that we, we do sometimes as part of baptism services where we have, we have people who are getting baptized and then people who maybe for a very long time, um, sometimes they've gone away from faith, sometimes they've kind of just come back. We say, you know what, you, you can do that. And so she did. A couple of months ago, Barbara, Barbara reaffirmed her baptism vows in front of everybody. And it's like a fire had got set under her. She is not the same person after she'd had that experience. There are so many other stories I could tell you. There's the story of the time in our, in our service when a, a, young, a young teenager, a young teenage leader, um, who'd never experienced anything like, bef- like this before, um, was, um, was approached by, by someone else in the congregation. He said, oh, well, I think I've actually got a prophetic word for you. I think the Spirit's telling me, telling me this about you. And she said, oh, okay, thank you very much. It's always important to test these things yourself. It's always important to receive them and then, and then test them and then wait on God for them. But, you know, she got kind of a confirmation pretty soon afterwards because about 30 seconds later, another person from the other side of the room wandered over and said exactly the same thing to her. God giving her new direction. Very specific new direction. There was a time a few weeks later when, when, when um, we felt God, God offering the, the ministry of healing to some people. And um, the ministry of healing, uh, laying on hands for healing. You see it all over the Bible. We don't always see it today. But we prayed for some people to, to, to heal. And then asked if there was anyone in, in, in the room who needed healing. A couple of people put their hands up, four people. We went over in small groups and prayed for each of them. Each of them was healed. It was a four out of four success rate. I've never seen anything like that. It was incredible. Because the thing is that when you're in the river, when you're actually in there, when you're not standing on the banks and looking on, when you're not standing by the trickle and thinking, oh, you know, I'm not really sure about all of this. When you're actually in the river, that's the place where the waves come. And the power of the Spirit is not something that you can or need to generate. It comes from the river. You can know the real from the counterfeit by that. And you can know the real from the results, from the fruits. That verse again, wherever the river flows, life will flourish. Great schools of fish, because the river is turning the salt sea into fresh water. Where the river flows, life abounds. This spirit is something that we want to be drenched in. The gifts and fruits of the spirit are something that we want to have in us. And also for us to carry with us. But I mean, who are we in relation to this? And where are we? Where are you as individuals? Where is this church? Are you intimidated? Have you seen it all before? Oh, yeah, we've done that. Do you feel like actually personally you're going through that desert? Do you have the desert perspective? Where actually you just don't see any water anywhere. Or do you see something, but you see it like Ezekiel saw when he just kind of stood right on the edge? You see a trickle, but you're not seeing the flood. What do we do? Well, Jesus said, he was talking to a Samaritan woman at the well, 
You might want to know that story. When he was talking to her in John 4, he said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, because he's asked, he'd asked her for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. How do you get it? You just have to ask. It's not based on your background. If you know that story, um, she's a Samaritan woman. So she's part of the group that, that was kind of isolated from the worship of the temple in Jerusalem. If you know that story, you know that she's, she's the lady with five husbands and the man that she's living with isn't her husband. And Jesus knows all that. But he still says this to her. It's not based on our background. It's not based on what we've done. It's not based on our personal qualities. It's just based on our willingness to ask, our thirstiness. It's a bit like the believers at Pentecost. You read at the beginning of Acts that a group of timid, frightened disciples who had seen Jesus, their great teacher, who had done all this stuff, and they'd seen it all, and, and oh yeah, that all works, and actually they'd done it all themselves, but they, then they'd seen him die, and then come back to life, but oh, what now? They didn't know where they were going next, until suddenly, on the day of Pentecost, they received the Spirit. And that changed things. It changed them from a timid group who were afraid and hiding and praying in a closed room and bust them out onto the streets amongst the festival that was going on. We can't ride the wave unless we're in the river. It might be that you think, actually, I'm, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. You know, people say, oh, maybe I'm a glass half full kind of guy or a glass half empty kind of guy. No, don't sell for that. If your glass is half full or half empty, then really what you need to say is, that's not my cup. My cup is always full. My cup is always overflowing. That's what Jesus offers. That's what his living water is. We need this for ourselves. We need it for our families. We need it for our friends. We need it for this community here. We need it down at the burden bush. We need it at Acorn Pharmacy. We need it in the co-op. We need it if you're going to go visit in the nursing home or if you live there. We need it in the community center. We need it in all the houses. We need the river. So I want to give God an opportunity to do something here this morning. So why don't we all stand up, stretch ourselves out a little bit. Remember that Jesus said that if you really knew who I was, you would ask me for living water. All we've got to do is ask. But I think that there's a bit more of a step that we need this morning. Because this is a significant morning. I wasn't... I was, I was, I was scheduled in to come here months ago. Months before we knew that last Sunday was going to be Glenn's last Sunday. And I wonder if that was for a reason. And if it was for a reason, it was this. 
that God is inviting you as a church to get in the river, to take a step. And so symbolically of that, more than anything, I'd like to invite those of you who do want to take that step to actually just come down into this front part of the church, just in this little bit. And then after you do that, we'll, we'll pray. I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come in a moment and then I'll come along and I'll lay a hand on you each and pray for a filling of his Holy Spirit. Maybe for some of you, you've never actually really been baptized in the Holy Spirit, never encountered God like that before. Maybe for some of you, you have before, but now you're actually just feeling empty, feeling like you need a, need a filling again. That's okay. God promises to come and fill you again. Jesus, we invite you into this place. These people before you want to get into the river. They don't want to stand on the shore. They want to be there. And they want you to come in waves of your love waves of your mercy, waves of your grace. So we ask, come Holy Spirit and fill each of them.